This is Changeling the Podcast. Greetings everyone, Puga here, coming at you with a rather different mini-sode than usual. I'll be handling this one solo as I go through the sourcebook Le Monde des Ténèbres France, World of Darkness France, which was released by Ludis International at the start of 1997. This is a general World of Darkness book in French for France, and I put my French major to use in an attempt to at first translate and then, in the interest of time, merely summarize the Changeling content for the podcast. So I'll be going through the Changeling chapter in this book, as well as a few uh, bits of ancillary material, in an effort to see how much of this is borne out in C20. This is the book that the Morganet and the Kored originally came from, but I was curious to see how much of the other lore about France uh, was present. So we start with a general history of the Fey by a she-bard named Sir Kadfanan. He talks about the mythic age of the Tuaha giving way to banality, which pushed their children west, many of whom hid out in France's wilderness rather than setting sail across the sea from the coast of Brittany. We also hear about Le Pacte du Crépuscule, which was the Fey, the mages, and the Garou forming an alliance to preserve the dreaming, pagan paradigms, and Guy's balance from the encroaching Romans. They failed. So the Fey were driven deeper into hiding by the spread of Christianity, which brings us into Les Ages Sombres, the Dark Ages. The barbarian invasions of Europe enabled the rise of Fey realms in Brittany and the Black Forest, but the church corrupted many glades and possibly freeholds as well as trods. There is a note in the book that I think indicates that many of the Fey went unsealy, but it's a bit unclear. I'll also just point out at this point, I had not read uh, Changeling de Songe, which is the French Changeling the Dreaming, before reading this book, so figuring out some of the terms was uh, a learning process. The book does acknowledge that in medieval times there were a few bright spots of glamour. There were the troubadours of Toulouse, the cosmopolitan court of Provence that welcomed mages and fay, the heretical Cathars, who nevertheless had some progressive ideas about religion, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, who we've seen had an influence in Vampire over the Toreador of the time. So all of that is followed by l'éclatement, which is the term for the shattering. The book notes the paranoia of inquisitors, the foundation of the Camarilla, and the heating up of mage warfare. Uh, For anyone who's unfamiliar with mage, the White Tower of Languedoc in southern France was in the 13th century where the Order of Reason first was getting their start. So all of this is a little more generalized than just abruptly saying, it was the Black Death, which I appreciated. Anyway, this history concludes by saying that the commoners became changelings, gathering around their bale fires and preserving what they could of a country that was once rich in glamour. And then at this point, another chronicler jumps in. William de Combe, a poet, says that since the Renaissance, vampires and the technocracy in particular have made France into a, quote, centralized, rigid, and sclerotic state, in spite of the revolution, the age of enlightenment, etc. They also really pick on Emile Zola here. I don't know if anyone's read Emile Zola, but I didn't think he deserved quite this much guff. In any case, um, it feels like a narrow view of banality and glamour, and because this was so comparatively early in Changeling's run, I think some of the diversification of those two forces had not really been established in the game line at this point. But it seems as though all of this also caused French Cathane to become overall more traditional and conservative, or at least that's the claim against which the author contrasts the 1920s when post-war art movements were like a mini resurgence of glamour in France but unfortunately those didn't last long. So then one more chronicler enters, described as a defeated member of the Saint-Malo commune. There are a lot of references to individuals, places, and events that come later in the chapter, which was a little bit confusing. So this chronicler talks about the demonstrations of 1968 as having the mark of the Fey and the Bruja, interestingly. Uh, There's a note, I think, that they set up freeholds in various educational spaces where anyone who entered walked out enchanted for the cause, and ultimately this was a failed revolution. There are repeated references to a totalitarian and all-powerful monarch named Shail, which it wasn't clear who that was at this point, but I wondered if that was maybe the root of English language changeling saying that Nustria, the name for the Fey realm of France in uh, other changeling books, 
if this is the root of it being so uh, she dominated and conservative, there's an implication that he's like a lost one monarch that never went back to Arcadia and has exercised this sort of iron grip over France. Anyway, the king was holed up in his fortress in the mythically enchanted Procellion forest when the resurgence hit. The Accordance War in France pushed many Cathayne into grumptum or into becoming Dantain. Others fled or died as martyrs for the commoner cause, and the fighting continued until the early 1980s when the nobles were bored of fighting and negotiated a peace. Maybe they also realized at that point they needed to focus on staving off banality as Arcadian she. And some of the commoner leaders were granted domains as a show of goodwill, but because the Shi are masters at politics, they still hold all of the true power. And that's the outlines of history. We then get into subdivisions of the realm, individual kingdoms within France, beginning with Le Royaume des Houles, which is the kingdom of the swells or the waves. These are the coasts and islands of Brittany where the Morganad live. The former capital of Is is lost beneath the waves, and now the kingdom is an ununifiable patchwork of communes founded by wilder revolutionaries. So Is is a traditional Breton legend about a sunken city. You can find more information about that online. The height of its power was in the Dark Ages when it was the center of many trods that led to Arcadia and similar fey realms, including Tirnanog, which is referenced, I think, as a dreaming realm elsewhere and not synonymous with Arcadia in the early first edition material, but it kind of opens the question of whether there are actually multiple versions of Arcadia. So the story presented here is pretty much adapted from one version of the legend, and the text does note that there are different versions. There was a super noble knight slash prince named Gradlon who had resisted the charms of his queen when he then met the fairy kingdom's queen, Aes, and a group of nine fae who lived offshore prophesied the shattering and the founding of a city ruled by a human and a fae together. It would be in the mortal world and the dreaming. From this came the dream of Is. Gradlon is sworn to secrecy about his fae lover, but then mentions her, and that sets a whole chain of prophecy into motion. Aes comes to the king's court so that Gradlon can be released from his vows to follow her into the waves and thus into the dreaming. He returns years later dressed as a monarch with his supposed daughter, Daoud, and this is just Aes in disguise as a changeling. Eventually their kingdom of East sinks beneath the waves, with Gradlon being the sole human to escape. There's a red prince who convinced Daoud to sink the city's mortal side and create a lost one freehold out of it. The Red Prince is implied in some versions of the story to be the devil, but there's a lot here. Basically, it's an anything you want it to be dream realm. And there's also references to the Sherman Dais, which are the, the paths of Aes. There are these mysterious ley line things, which I guess are supposed to correspond to the lines of megaliths that crisscross Brittany. Maybe they're trods as well. So the kingdom has fractured since East disappeared, and now it's this disunified group of fiefs. There's Belil, which is the seat of the Seneschal Druon the Troll, who technically holds the power, but not really. There's Petite Mer on the south coast, ruled by a fiercely independent unseelie she, Garlon, who has ties to Banshees. Banshees are like a big deal here, which was a bit surprising. There's the formerly bohemian town of Concarneau that is now a tourist trap. And the Comte de Mirochet, a flourishing realm ruled by Galien of House Islanad, who's fixing to stop paying glamour taxes to King Chaillot. So, treachery. So then there's the write-up of the Morganid. Note that the singular is one Morgan. Morganid is the plural. They seem a lot more like the eventual mare who appeared in blood-dimmed tides in that they're mysterious and unpredictable, sensual and proud, but they have a lot more contact with the shoreline and go on land regularly, although this version just says that they take on human form to do so, whatever that means. They're similar to the C20 version in that they're associated with dreams of the ocean's wonder, but rather than fight against pollution, here they're annoyed with humans because of tourism and property speculation. The suggested professions for them, which I don't believe was in the C20 write-up, include sailors, lighthouse keepers, hermits, dock workers, and more. In terms of birthrights and frailty, the first birthright is a minus two difficulty to all roles in the water, not just dexterity as specified in C20, or at least I didn't see the word dexterité in there. Their Song of the Sea pretty much does the same siren thing. And then their frailty linked to the sea has a mysterious note that if the Morgan has no access to water whatsoever, they lose two points of glamour. Not sure whether that's temporary or permanent or how often or what that's supposed to mean, but there it is. 
Then we have information about le cercle des insurgés disparus, the circle of disappeared insurgents, and this is an O circle set against the backdrop of French university protests. They're all about keeping up the counterculture in the face of academic banality. And I'm all for that, but the writing here has like les miserables levels of pathos, totally speaking. The O circle members interestingly show their mortal name, then their fey name. They include Oriel, the Guidian leader, Sadoc, his troll squire, Oriel's cousin, Evian of House Fiona, and the knocker Eflam, a neo-situationist iconoclast, which is a concept that could only be in this book about France. Naturally, they're all wilders and students on the campus at Rennes. Their freehold is a hidden room on campus used by revolutionary students over the decades. They have a satyr grump bookkeeper ally named Yeiris, and Mike, their daunting syndicalist nemesis. I strongly suspect this was all from a game the authors ran in college or something, but... Anyway, they have a whole built-in history and relationship web thing if a reader would want to use them. So then we have Les Domaines de Songe, the realms of dream. We're told that unlike Concordia, France is steeped in banality thanks to the presence of vampires and technocrats, and the King Cheil holds things in equilibrium the best he can. He rules from the Royaume des Premiers Arbres, which is centered on Brasiliande, and I really love the realm of Brittany in this book, because I guess it's Celtic and therefore tied to Changeling. The timeline gets a little bit muddy here. There's a history of how Shail usurped the throne from his former liege and became a tyrant, but it all seems to be during the later Sundering, and it's unclear at this point whether Shail stayed on Earth and is a lost one, or came back in the resurgence and reestablished power. Like, it's a little bit murky. But in any case, we get a travelogue from a Concordian ambassador, which is an excuse to lead us through various parts of the kingdom. He remarks how uncomfortable he is because of the lack of glamour, and he's annoyed because of the king's envoy being a puka, until he gets to Brasiliande where everything is just steeped in glamour. So it definitely sounds like a lost one freehold to me, especially when the ambassador talks about how the last of the Corred are hiding there, vulnerable to banality. Note that one of them also has been knighted as a member of Maison Queville, which is House Queville. Not sure what the full story is, but it seems like it's an offshoot of Liam later on, so maybe someone's homebrew, I guess you could cast that as a banner house in C20 terms. And then we get the write-up for the Kored. Like the Morganed, Kored is plural, and the singular is Kor, with two R's. I'm rolling the R there, I don't know that I actually need to. They're pretty similar to their presentation in C20, although they look more like garden gnomes here, and less like C20's Furby Mogwai crossbreed monstrosity. We're told nothing is more important to a core than their word, and that they're the she's dream subjects because they keep to old traditions, all of which they can remember. They're sort of like Boggins crossed with Slua, and they can't resist learning secrets, which they value more than dross. Their testament birthright is almost the same as in C20. Their balance birthright formerly just kept them out of bedlam at the storyteller's discretion, and then with the truth frailty, they needed to roll willpower difficulty 8 to lie, even indirectly. And the ones presented here also have the Arcadian chief frailty, since they're by default assumed to be members of Shail's court, hiding from banality. It does point out, though, the storyteller can waive this to have uh, incarnated changeling Kored, if desired. Then we get more information about the other realms of France, the official realms. So the Royaume de Bretagne is considered the leader, with uh, Royaume de Premiers Arbres, Shail's realm, as the leader among leaders. So then we get more about the other realms. Uh, all of the ones I just listed are part of Bretagne in the west. Confusingly, Royaume de Sol, the Kingdom of Willows, is also mentioned here, and they do say ruled by Melgia, so <laughs> I don't know if the Kingdom of Willows temporarily was relocated to Brittany, or the implication is just that Melgia is their ally somehow. There are also five duchies that are Chayel's vassals scattered around France. There's Arche, which is Paris, Brume, which is the Jura Mountains, Terchaud, which is Poitou in the south-central part, Umbran, which is Land on the western coast, and Sim, which is the Alps. Other kingdoms around France are based in Flanders on the Belgian border, the Basque country on the Spanish border, Alsace and Lorraine on the German border, Normandy on the English Channel, and Auvergne in the south, which has the interesting quote, the White Queen rules in the kingdom of the Lac du Boucher, the last of the region, so a mysterious statement and Chartres, which is ruled by Ishu. It's interesting that the southeast coast is kind of unrepresented here, like the French Riviera. <laughs> and there's also all these references to people in places I don't recognize, but also can't find anything about on the internet. So, And there's a lot of political information that reiterates the same stuff. Shail is a tyrant, and 
Bretagne is ununifiable, etc. But then other interesting bits include the Vouivre, or Melusine, a true fay who's the only one that can get away with ignoring Chaillot's rule, the poor quality of glamour from local dreamers, and then the note that the influence of banality in France is such that all roles to increase glamour are at plus two difficulty, and reverie takes twice as long. So probably good they got rid of that, because that would make a game pretty much impossible, I would say. There's a little tour through France from the point of view of a corps named Erwan, where each section starts with a little fable and then outlines historical details. So it's nice to finally get those with the kingdoms. It was weird that like we got a very brief overview of the kingdoms, then pages of politics, and then details about the kingdoms. So I was like, what's going on there? But briefly, there's in Flanders, it's a faded kingdom of Andines and giants, but only one of those is left sleeping in a canal. This is also long before Inanime came out, so Andines are just kind of mentioned without more detail. The Basque Country is a trod-filled area of mountains, formerly ruled by Mari, who's a goddess in the Basque pantheon. Many unique kits and dragons! In Alsace, Benaldi is particularly strong, potentially due to the history of war but the Ondines who live in the Rhine cling to power. Normandy is a patchwork of kingdoms drained of their glamour by Chille, because Britannia is right next door. It's crisscrossed by trods, and also apparently a she made the Bayeux tapestry, and there are cave-dwelling gnomes. Finally, Auvergne is mostly redcaps, with the White Queen, who I just mentioned, ruling from the bottom of a lake. There's also mention of the Beast of Girodon, and that it might be a feral garou. If anyone has seen the film Le Parc de Loup, Brotherhood of the Wolf, that's the beast we're talking about. Then we have Les Sentiers du Songe, still in Erwan's voice, giving notes on the chimerical landscape. There's a piece that suggests banality has a stranglehold on France, and that the Fay are trying to catalog all the enchanted places and trods they can before they're gone. The labyrinth on the floor of Chartres Cathedral leads to the glade of the Kingdom of Karn, removed from reality by its issue sovereign, Achevera. Again, there's so many things in here that feel like pieces from people's game that they had the opportunity to put into a semi-official book and they were like yeah why not so then another piece explains that because Strasbourg is the seat of the EU parliament it's the capital of banality not sure how I feel about that but a secret lake under its cathedral leads to a reflection city possibly filled with vampires and marauders so I really like that idea as a story hook and then lastly, Sentier Perdu covers a number of other places. The Standing Stones of Carnac, Mont Saint-Michel, which was formerly the central trod of Normandy, the Kingdom of Lorraine, which is in ruins but still has a powerful and storied trod of seven stones by the Meuse River, and Lac Genin, which is a fey realm at the bottom of a lake guarded by a serpentine vouivre, but apparently not the same as Melusine, which was confusing. They also keep talking about trods as fountains of glamour and using the word kingdom liberally, so there was some terminological uncertainty on my part. Anyway, that's the chapter. The appendix then has some NPCs. Jagalhon the dragon, who is a full-on dragon. Malvis, a satyr barkeeper. Sir Oriel, who's the leader of that student oath circle. King Shail, his core master of ceremonies, Folinel, and his personal advisor, Senor Blaise. And that's pretty much all the changeling material in this book. Overall, the way that the chapter was structured felt kind of clunky to me. I probably would have done the summary of Faye France in terms of banality, etc. first, then the history, then a tour of various realms, whether in the travelogue format presented here or otherwise, with specifics about each one's trods and legendary places, then the survey of politics, then the common or motley, and then both new kith write-ups at the end. So if I could rewrite it, that's how I would do it. The tone was grandiloquent in a way that sometimes made it distracting. I had to keep like consulting my French dictionary because there were all of these uh, archaisms that I had probably not encountered since French literature class. And I wondered why there was so much focus on trods, like much more than freeholds, they kept talking about the trods. So, uh. Aside from it sounding like the author set their game in Brittany and ported it into this book, there may be other pieces of the French metaplot that I didn't see because I didn't read thoroughly through the rest of the book, and there are so many references to specific places, people, and events. It might also be because it's the first time I'm trying to really translate a French RPG book directly and quickly, and so I may have missed some of the pieces. 
But overall, the way Neustria is presented later only lightly corresponds to this, both in 2nd edition and in C20. We're told there's lots of banality, but not that it's crawling with Xi. We have unclear information about Shail, and nothing about Rathsmir, the High Lord of House Fiona, who also lives in France. The commoner insurgency seems to have lasted longer and never fully petered out after the resurgence, but in later material, it makes it sound like the Xi very quickly took over. So overall, this wouldn't be impossible to integrate with second edition in C20 material, but it would take a lot of work. And also, the book very specifically avoids Paris, because apparently they wanted to do that later, and I don't know that they ever did. And that's pretty much the relevant information for Changeling the Dreaming in this book that I could find. So I hope it was informative and maybe gives you a little bit of background and mythological hooks to explore if you choose to set your game in France. But uh, yeah, overall, I would say you're probably not missing much if you have not picked up this book because you have versions of the Morganid on the Corrid already in C20. You have basic information about Nostria, and I don't think it's that difficult to flesh it out in a different way than the very specific and idiosyncratic way that this book did. Nevertheless, it was nice to see proper Breton and Basque and Occitan mythology kind of poking their heads in here. So I appreciated that. That's about all for this mini-sode. Merci à tous d'avoir écouté. Je suis encore le Pouca, et jusqu'à la prochaine fois, continuez à rêver.